Now, before we get this Q&A video started, I want to take a moment or two to talk about something, so humor me if you don't mind. Uh, Jason Solomon, who many of you know as the Solomonster, one of the more notable wrestling podcasters out there. He's been on his grind for over a decade doing this stuff. I salute him. Lost his mother Monday after a lengthy battle with cancer. That most insidious of diseases. And I know it's been... A rough go for him personally in dealing with all this stuff and the stress that went along with that frankly slowly watching the woman that gave birth to you pass away in front of your eyes a few years after your dad passing away you know so now you're talking about a guy who's close to my age that doesn't have either one of his parents around anymore so if you care at all, go to his social media, at Solomonster on Twitter, go to one of his videos, and give him your best wishes. You don't have to, I'm not demanding that you do, but just saying, if you haven't done so already, might be a nice thing to do, um, because that's tough. That's a, that's, a, that's a real tough, tough deal, especially as you watch somebody that you love and care about so much just wither away, and, and there's no other way to put that, and it's frustrating because you see a guy like that and you're like, why do people have to sit there and go through that type of stuff in such a short period of time? So hopefully he will get back to being the soothing solemn monster and seducing the ladies very soon and let them know to stay solemn monster strong. And it's stuff like this that reminds you when we sit there and we gripe and we piss and moan about, really frankly, let's be honest, dumb, inconsequential things like professional wrestling and many other things too, that we can lose sight of what's important, we can lose sight of priorities, what really matters in the world. And I see it in our world today, regardless of your belief or affiliation, it's, it's a really frustrating world to be in. Because everybody's got to be right about something, everybody else has got to be wrong about something. Everybody wants to talk about this and that and everything else. And it feels like one of those things that should just be like a common enemy of every decent person out there is cancer. It feels like everybody, directly, indirectly themselves, people they've known, people they've loved, have been affected by that disease. And many of you probably watching this video have been personally impacted losing somebody to that most insidious of diseases that is cancer. I know I have, and I'm sure many of you had too. And let's hope someday, instead of fighting wars in foreign countries and arguing over damn things like gun violence and um, inequality in our system on a variety of different levels and tax policies and all this other hot garbage, that we could actually unite someday to actually say, you know what? This is an important enough enemy cancer that we can all agree that this needs to go the hell away. And we someday find a cure for most, if not all, forms of cancer, if they're not already out there now. But it should also serve as a reminder, and I look at Jason and I'm like, you know, he's not much different than me in terms of age, and he's lost both of his parents. I still technically have both of mine. And maybe some of you only ever had one parent. Maybe some of you were lucky enough to have both of your parents. Maybe some of you have lost one or both of your parents. Um, but if anything else, you get anything else out of this video, take the time sometime this week, this weekend. I know I think Easter's coming up this weekend, whatever the heck. Um, if you haven't talked to your mom or your dad or your parents or family for a while, maybe you should. If you're beefing with them, Unless it's like super seriously important, which it's usually not, get over yourself and make the call. Go see them. Because I can tell you from my own experience, I haven't talked to my dad in like four and a half years. And I think about it all the time. I haven't seen my mother since probably 2012. So that's what, six years going on now? I talk to her maybe once every week to two weeks and that's about it. Now granted, I have my specific reasons at times, and unfortunately as an adult, I've prioritized other things and not always prioritize 
keeping in contact with them, keeping in touch with them, and what, what have you. And it's not necessarily that I'm totally wrong, but it still doesn't mean that I'm not being a complete and total idiot. Because as many of you know, because I don't shut up about it, I'm in my late 30s, I'm 37 now. My mom will be, what, 66 this year in November? Uh, with heart issues for years and one kidney that, of course, all have happened immediately after I was born. Let her know how much of a pain in the ass I was going to be in this world. And my dad is 63 now. And I, I see people like Jason, the Sol Monster, and I think about, you know, what a freaking fool I am to take them for granted. Yeah, I've got my issues with them, and I've got things that I don't know that I'll ever be able to get over when it comes to them. But it also gets to a point in time like, I'm a grown-ass man, and I should act like a grown-ass man and prioritize these things because I guarantee you this much. They will not be there forever, and someday when I'm really going to need them and really going to want to talk to them or see them, they won't be there anymore. And that'll be a, a, a tough day and totally and completely of my own doing. So I guess the biggest thing that comes out of this, if nothing else out of any of the other questions that I answer in this video, if you have one of those type of situations where you haven't talked to one of your parents for a long time, you know what, even if you're right, and you very well might be, don't be like me. Get over it. Get the hell over yourself. And talk to them. Talk to them on the phone. Go see them. Like, I wish I could see my mom, but I mean, she's all the way back in Illinois. Contrary to the popular belief that I live in my mother's basement. I haven't lived with my mother since I was 18 years old. Thank you very much. But throughout my adult life, especially once I moved out to Iowa in 2007, you know, maybe saw her like once a year, maybe twice at most. She's not a technically inclined woman, so I can't exactly just pull her up on the social media or on a smartphone or anything like that. That's a lot of lost time that we will never get back that, importantly to me, I will never get back. So do yourself a favor. Don't do it because I'm asking you to. Just think about it. Do yourself a favor. And whoever it is that's most important to you, don't take them for granted. Um, call them, text them, email them, message them, go see them. Because someday they might not be there for you to do that. And you're really going to regret it. And you're going to feel like a freaking moron. So my best to the Sala Monster. And hopefully all of you guys can take something positive out of this. And affect some change for yourself if you feel like you need to. Anyways, now that I brought the whole mood of the video down significantly, let's go ahead and answer some questions and try to have a light, entertaining video the rest of the way. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, WNC Podcast kicks us off by asking, is Braun Strowman in danger of becoming the next Ryback in terms of getting to a point where he was probably title ready and then they didn't pull the trigger and then they didn't pull the trigger and then they didn't pull the trigger and then it became too late? I believe so. We're not at that point quite yet, but we're getting there in 2018 where if it doesn't happen by SummerSlam, you might have some issues unless you did a big massive character change, unless you twist him to a different show. Um, as far as being on Raw, the current form of the Braun Strowman character, he needs that belt by SummerSlam, period. He really does. Because if he doesn't get it, it will impact him a little bit. Uh, Brian Walmer, your thoughts on Toys R Us closing down and your fondest memories of it? Uh, my thoughts on it closing down is I'm not surprised. It was years in the making, similar to like Radio Shacks and many other retailers that were frankly high-priced bullshit and didn't adjust to the modern times. You can blame the internet, you can blame Walmart and all these other things. Toys R Us killed Toys R Us and I feel no sympathy for it whatsoever. And as far as my fondest memories of them, shit. I think the first time I ever stepped inside of a Toys R Us was as an adult. I was rich people toys. Ain't no way in hell my white broke ass was stepping into a Toys R Us, let alone being able to afford any damn thing. If we're keeping it real. So I have no fond memories of it whatsoever because it was like a foreign entity to me. And perhaps is an indication of the long-term problems that they face. 
because in many ways they were viewed to be too high price for a lot of people and it was partially true. They also did it to themselves as other brands have done, such as McDonald's with getting away from Ronald McDonald, those things that you become more noticeable for and they become iconic, they become easily identifiable with your brand and you go away from Jeffrey the giraffe? Like, I don't want to grow up because if I did, I couldn't be a Toys R Us kid. And then there's the big stupid giraffe sitting on the bench or something. Then they went away from that. You know, you look at the WWE, they changed the name from WWF almost 16 damn years ago. And a lot of people that aren't in the know still call them the WWF and not the WWE. They know what the company is, but they don't even know the name. So the point is, is the branding matters. They did it to themselves. It sucks for the people that work there. Unfortunately, it's the reality of our economic world, and I have no fond memories of them, so they can fuck right off. Cheshire Cat 23, what type of cell phone do you have? We're getting some random ones here. Just some basic old Samsung Galaxy, like one or two. I just use like Boost Mobile. It's 35 bucks a month. I get unlimited phone that I hardly use, and then I get unlimited internet, and that's good enough for me. I'm not a huge tech guy, unfortunately, to my own detriment when it comes to doing these type of things. Um, so the cell phone just doesn't really matter that much. It should. I should get a better one, a one preferably that doesn't have the broken, the mostly broken screen that that one does, um, <laughs> and start using it more. You know, that way I could get on. What do the kids say? Uh, Snap or the Gram? Um, but yeah, it's just some old. Samsung Galaxy 1, whatever the hell it is. It's a cheapo, rinky-dinky thing, but it is at least a smart phone on the Android platform or whatever the hell you want to call it. Uh, Z Slayer 7, who is your favorite rapper? Favorite rapper, like, historically? Probably Pac. Um, favorite more modern rapper? Probably Nas and Eminem. Uh, L. Harris Swan, if you could play God and give one Breakfast Club member a son, who would it be? If I was God and I could give it to one Breakfast Club member, then ugh, I would give myself a son. Why? Because I'm fucking God. And that means I've given Vince a grandson. Seems like an easy answer to me. <laughs> The Ryan Steele. What happens first? The Bears win the Super Bowl or the Bulls win the NBA title? I think it's much more likely the Bears win a Super Bowl because of the nature of the beast in the NFL. There's so much turnover from year to year. So many things can change. Whereas with the NBA, frankly, if you're not on the super team bandwagon, you're not one of the four or five teams constructed like that, you have no chance. Like with the Bears, at least you could say in the NFL that anything can happen from one season to the next. Like who the hell thought the Philadelphia Eagles were going to win Super Bowl 52, especially once Carson Wentz tore up his knee? Much more likely the Bears would win a Super Bowl before the Bulls win another NBA title. Eric Dennis, what would wrestling be like if Benoit didn't do what he did in 2007? That is an interesting question. Would the entire business be that much different? Probably not. Would the WWE have went to the PG rating in 2008, which I still believe was in direct, a direct result, a direct action caused by what, what happened with Benoit in 2007? It was a way to get themselves more advertiser-friendly to try and distance themselves from that? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know how much different it would be overall, though. Jeremy Matthews, will you be watching the Andre the Giant documentary? I will make it a point to watch it but I do not have HBO, and I believe it's on HBO, so I might not watch it live. I'm sure somebody will post on the internet, and I'll probably watch it then. Rick Styles, what are some things you want to see between Mania and SummerSlam? Just give me a couple of stories that are interesting. Um, continue to do good things with guys like Elias and Braun Strowman. Uh, start doing some good things with Rusev to match how over he is. Um... They don't need to reinvent the wheel. I'm curious to see what happens with Ronda Rousey post-WrestleMania. I think that will be interesting to see. Um, but those are probably some of the things I'm looking at. Joe Del Vecchio. How come you don't see wrestlers get their arms tied up in the ropes anymore? 
I think part of that is just a change in the business in general. The business has gotten smaller, so you have fewer bigger monster guys where that really makes sense to do that. Because if you're doing that with somebody like a, a Daniel Bryan or a Finn, well, Daniel Bryan it would work because he's so massively loved as a babyface, but like Finn Balor. You know, a lot of fans like him, especially the hardcores, but him getting tied up in the ropes is not the type of story that they want to see that performer, that character tell. And it just doesn't work the same. Like it would for Daniel Bryan because he's able to ev evoke such a level of sympathy that it would be a genius spot for him to do because it's so easy to do and so low risk and tell such a phenomenal story. But yeah, the days of like Andre the Giant getting wrapped up in the ropes, I wish more guys did that, especially with the bigger guys because it's an easy way to tell a story. It's a low risk way to do something and it's something different other than everybody doing flips and kicks and a bunch of high spots. But I think it's the nature of the beast that guys got into the business and had to learn how to flip and kick and do all this high stuff and didn't learn how to actually work and how to tell a story and actually involve the audience in a meaningful, substantive way. Life forever. Should they use Daniel Bryan to get young heels over? Yes. Like that should be the primary purpose, at least for the short and intermediate term, if he's going to work more than just WrestleMania 34. Because anybody that Daniel Bryan goes against is instantly hated. That should be his entire purpose. Absolutely should be his entire purpose. Like in an ideal world, you would have a Daniel Bryan here. Like let's say AJ or Shinsuke is your champion on Retarded Raw. So they're your top babyface. Daniel Bryan should be your number two babyface that your young heel has to go through to get ready for the champ. Because Daniel Bryan can get all this heat on that heel down here. Then you could send him up there and you can make some money. So it should be the primary role for him, frankly. Uh, Lalt87. One wrestler dead or alive you'd most want to have a beer with. One wrestler dead or alive that I most want to have a beer with. Uh, Andre would be a choice just because I'd want to see... Um, if the drinking stories were all true, and I'm sure they mostly all were. Uh, Haku, because I know if we got in a fight, I feel like I'm good. So Haku would be another one. And then probably somebody like Junkyard Dog. So those might be the three that I could think of. I don't know if I could narrow it down to one. Although I might lean towards Andre or Haku for the reasons that I've already outlined. A uh, Hug Life for Life. Should Bray come back with a gimmick demanding you pay your child support? Yes. Yes, yes, you are the father. The paternity court says you owe this much. Imagine him coming back and his first mini feud was with Heath Slater. You got kids and you're not paying for them. <laughs> It'd be infinitely more interesting than the Bray Wyatt character has done anything in the past year and year and a half at least. Uh, Matthew Schoenberger. If Bernie Sanders joined the WWE, what would be his finisher and his catchphrase? Hebrew hot sauce, the kosher kick. No. <laughs> I think it's easy. Not the, <laughs> the Trump dump. <laughs> the 99%. I mean, his catchphrase has got to be feel the burn, doesn't it? It feels like it. Uh, as far as his finisher... I mean, I, I've named several options. I mean, I don't know what one specifically we would go with. Maybe we'd call it the regulator. That way you could bring down the corruption in the system and all this other stuff. Imagine Bernie Sanders dressed up as the ultimate warrior, but he's the social justice warrior. And he's, he's got his yarmulke, he's got a... He's got dreidels in both hands. He's got freaking tassels here. I know I'm going off on my own thing, but the visual of that is interesting, to say the least. Uh, Sam Katz, why can't you be more like Dave Meltzer? Well, <laughs> a couple of things, Sam. That's kind of a snarky-ass question. I kind of like it, actually. Uh, Dave Meltzer is almost 60. Dave Meltzer got in on the ground level three and a half decades ago, four decades ago. He got in to start doing that stuff even before Wrestling Observer Newsletter, before I was even alive. So he has decades upon decades of connections and history and all this other stuff. He got in on the grassroots when I was a kid. And you can't say that that 
doesn't matter at all because it does. Um, from a personal standpoint, I don't know even if I wanted to that I could make the living the way that he does, reporting gossip and dirt sheet news, because I'd always feel kind of smarmy doing it. It's not smarmy to do it. It's just I would feel kind of slimy doing it. So it's just not my bag. It's just not how I would want to get down. Nothing wrong with Dave doing it. He's made a very nice living for him and his family doing so. Uh, next thing, um, I'm not going to sit there and just blindly cuck for a certain brand and to me lose all types of credibility even though a lot of people don't want to call him out automatically because he's Dave Meltzer. No, none of us are infallible. Um, I'm not going to sit there and pretend like I'm not getting something under the table from New Japan even though I know I am and that bias creeps in. I'm always going to be as fair as I possibly feel like I can be, even if some of you don't feel like I am. And the fact is, is I'm probably as fair as anybody that does this type of stuff. If we're being real. I will hate on everybody equally. I will give praise on everybody equally, whether you want to give me credit for that or not. So there are a lot of reasons I can't be like Dave Meltzer. Nor do I aspire to be, nor do I want to be. It is cool that he has done his thing. I applaud anybody else that tries to go down a similar path like he did. But the reality is, it's really, really hard in today's world to be like Dave Meltzer. And that's just the way it is. Even though most of the other chop shop dirt sheets just rip off from him any damn ways. Which is ironic because on the flip side of that, he gets so many of his reports from the live events and stuff from people. And he doesn't pay them either. Um, Byron Lembo Frey. Why do you hate Dino Bravo? He's dead. Dino Bravo. El Cigaretta. <laughs> He's fucking Dino Bravo. Like Bret Hart said, he got injured in a match once. He's like, there's no way in hell I'm losing to Dino Bravo. And I'm not even a Bret fan, but that that sold me right there. He's fucking Dino Bravo. What, 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 what is there to like about him? Horror Movie Review 73. Who's the most overrated? Hogan, Austin, HBK, Brian, Punk, Shinsuke, AJ. Easy answer would be Shinsuke, because I haven't seen shit out of him on the WWE main roster. But that's kind of the easy, kind of like modernist thing to say. Um, most overrated to me has to be Shawn Michaels. Company's arguably best period ever from 98 to early mid-2002 was when Shawn Michaels wasn't really much of a factor at all. He was a bit player on television, and he wasn't a featured guy. You talk about when they did their 50 greatest superstars list, he was number one. By what measurement? Well, because he was a great in-ring performer. He was Mr. WrestleMania. All bullshit. You build your company around Shawn Michaels and you watch somebody pass you by. Oh, that's what Vince did in the mid-90s with him and Brett. And he watched as Hogan, Hall, and Nash, and the NWO ran roughshod over him for damn near two years in the ratings. So it's got to be freaking Shawn Michaels. Uh, Chase Gosney, who was the easiest Royal Rumble winner to see coming. Uh, 2013 Cena, I think that was clearly obvious. 2009, with the stuff they were doing with Orton, again, that felt like it was really telegraphed, like you know it was coming. Just because it was telegraphed doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Like, I don't think Orton winning the Rumble in 2009 was bad. Cena winning it in 2013, meh, different story. But those would be two of the more recent examples I feel like you could say you knew this was coming. Probably 2015 Roman Reigns, you knew this was coming. And we know how that went over. Uh, Mark Whalen, where do you put the build up to Mania 34 among the worst ever? Um, it's been very lame. I haven't spent much time thinking about is it the worst or one of the worst. Uh, but it's been pretty bad. I've got a general lack of interest in the show. And even though it's still mania, and when that day comes, I will still have that buzz feeling of a... And it's natural because it's mania. Yeah, it's just really not there in general for me. Andrew Harrington, will you do another booking video like Samoa Joe versus Brock Lesnar when you did last year? Ah, probably. Probably sometime after WrestleMania. There may be a surprise booking video before WrestleMania about a WrestleMania 34 dream card. 
but stay tuned for that one. The phenomenal one, who should Daniel Bryan's first feud after Mania be with? Uh, let's get through WrestleMania and see how he looks, see how he feels, see how he performs, and then we'll worry about it from there, okay? I'm just saying. Uh, Fanaki is God. Should AJ Styles and Shinsuke Nakamura open WrestleMania? No. It should mid-card WrestleMania. Daniel Bryan's return to a WWE ring should open WrestleMania because you want to get the night off to a hot start. That's where you do it. Shinsuke, AJ, put that mid-card, and you need that match mid-card. You're going to need that kind of pick-me-up, but also you get it where... It's still two and a half, three hours in, so people are going to care. And then if they don't care afterwards, so be it. Um, Ashwin, Punk, Brian, or AJ? Who's the best worker? AJ Styles. Brian Knight, has Brian's return made Mania more interesting for you? Only very, very slightly. Not much. Like if you were telling me he was coming back and it was going to be him and Miz uh, just in a grudge match at WrestleMania... Interest level increases a lot. Him as part of a throw-in for what the hell is going, ever is going on with Shane and then against Kevin and Owens and Sami Zayn. Eh, mostly good on that. A junior asks, thoughts on the one-and-done rule in college basketball? I hate the rule. Um, I think it leads to such an inferior product in college basketball, and it leads to teams like Loyola's 11 seed being able to get to the Final Four and being viewed as a potential national championship team. To me, it's always been one of those things you should either let them come out of high school right away, like you do in baseball, or if they don't, they got to stay two or three years in college. Part of that also being is that you actually pay these guys for their time, for their services, for their drawing power while they are in college. They make these schools a shit ton of money. They deserve to be able to get some of that back and no, just sitting there and saying, oh, the scholarship that they get. Like, I put it this way. Let's say you had a LeBron James went to school somewhere for one year. His freaking twenty-five, thirty thousand dollar a year scholarship is a f equitable share for all the money he's going to draw to the university. Bullshit. Absolute bullshit. It's like when his high school sitting there and they're playing in all these big arenas in front of fifteen, twenty thousand people. They're getting these nationally televised games. But LeBron gets suspended because he wants a hookup on a couple of jerseys. Now, it was dumb on his part, but frankly, the dude was drawing enough money at a freaking high school, mind you. He deserved a cut of the profits. It's capitalism only when they want it to be capitalism, and the rest of the time it's fuck everybody else. So, I hate the one and done rule. I understand why they did it, and I still hate it. Charles Mitchell. Is Lawrence Taylor Hall of Fame worthy since he's the only celebrity to have main evented WrestleMania? Yes, and I wouldn't be surprised if he ended up in the Hall of Fame next year. Paul M. Timus. Can Loyola of Chicago legitimately win the national championship? Um, with Duke out of the way, because Duke's size with Bagley and with Carter, I feel like would have been the death knell for Loyola, let's say, in the national championship game. I look at the Final Four as this way. Those four teams can all match up with each other in some ways. Any of those four teams can legitimately win the national championship this year, and that includes Loyola. They've beaten some better teams or more notable teams to get there. They believe now. Now they just have to execute. So, yeah, they can legitimately win, but so could Michigan, so could Kansas, and so could Villanova. But I'm not going to dismiss Loyola just because they're 11 seed. I know it's very unlikely that they would, but the way that team was playing, especially in that Elite Eight game against Kansas State, they very well could. Well, anyways, thanks to all of you that asked your questions, that got on this video, and even the ones that did that didn't end up on this video. Thanks for putting up with me for a few minutes on that kind of long diatribe at the beginning, but I felt like it was important. So remember, call whoever it is that you love and let them know you love them. I am the Schleg Daddy. This is OTRS Central. It's been another Q&A video. This is not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. I'll see you later.